Hello and welcome. I'm Cole and I am excited today to be broadcasting live from the Harley Davidson Museum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And now I'm mostly excited because I'm here today with the entire Storytelling with Data team. <laughs> uh, so up in front of the camera with me, we have Elizabeth, Mike, and Alex. Behind the scenes, helping make sure things run smoothly, we have Jody and Randy. And actually, we're all in Milwaukee this week because we're getting ready for a public workshop. And now this is when we have individuals join from all sorts of different organizations, different roles, come together for a day of learning and practicing to communicate effectively with data. And we're excited also because this is the first time we've done this in person for a very long time. And there is such energy that comes from being in the room and seeing other people and getting to feed off of that, which is super fun. By the way, if spending the better part of a day with us learning how to communicate with data sounds like fun to you, uh, we're sold out this week, but stay tuned to our website because we will soon be announcing our 2022 schedule, which also includes virtual workshops. Now, one of the things that always happens from these public workshops is that individuals go back to their respective companies with new eyes for graphs and for how we make graphs, not for ourselves, but first and foremost, for our audience. And often along with that comes a desire to share those lessons with colleagues. And so a big part of our work is doing client workshops where we'll spend half of a day with a team really getting into the nuances of how they communicate with data. And there is a magic that happens when we show this, not just in theory or with canned examples, but with examples from the given team. And so we actually thought we would share that process with you today, give you a chance to participate. So those who are joining live can do so through chat, share your ideas and questions and thoughts as we look through some different examples. And now each of these is based on a client example, but in all cases, they've been anonymized. Uh, so the numbers, the details are different, but the spirit of the example lives on. And I definitely encourage you for each of the ones that we look through to think about your own circumstances for communicating with data and how you might make use of some of the strategies you see put to use here today in your own work. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Elizabeth to take us through our first example. Hi, it's Elizabeth. So in this example, we will be taking a look at how we can transform a table. So let's actually take a look at an example of a table. I'll give you just a second to process what you're seeing and then we can do some discussion, both on the line and in the room as well. So for those of you who are watching, uh, tuning in, go ahead and in the chat window, let us know what are some of your reactions to this table. Um, and just to orient you what we're seeing, this is advertising spend by quarter. We can see that we're measuring our spend in millions across several different categories from direct mail all the way down to multiple types of channels. We're measuring this two different quarters, quarter two versus quarter three. And then we're also measuring the percentage of total. So as you are taking a look at this, I'm curious to know, uh, what are some initial reactions you all have to this table? Actually, Mike, I'll start with you. So when you face with this table for the first time, what do you think? Well, I look at this table and I think that this is exactly what a standard template in my charting tool of choice, in this case, most likely Excel, would give me. So I think about putting myself in the shoes of the person who created this table, and I think, well, maybe this person didn't have a lot of time to put something together with a lot of specific intention. So there might be a message in here that I'm not truly getting, 
because I'm just seeing things the way that my tool is saying, well, this is the baseline way I might create this. So I'd want to dig a little bit deeper into the data, maybe do some comparisons and see if there's any way I could visualize this to make some important things pop out a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Cole, what do you think? Well, we have some folks contributing via chat. Uh, Brandon mentioned that that green background is kind of intense. And we do have a it's lot pretty. going on there. It's it's a it's soothing pretty, color, it? I like at the least. Color green, yeah. But I think no one would argue with the idea that we might use our color more sparingly and intentionally. Uh, Sarah mentions it's hard to read the centered numbers mm. and text. Uh, and then we have a comment that this is just overwhelming. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Which is surprising because this is pretty simple data, right? It's um, pretty easy to understand. All of us know what advertising is. We can all relate to these different types of categories. But it is fascinating how when we give people tables to process, it takes a lot of brain power to figure out what we're looking at. And that is what we do when we give our audiences tables. Now, we should mention there's nothing wrong with the way this table is currently presented if it's for you, right? We all are gathering data. We're looking at it. We're figuring out what are the interesting things. But then when we give that table to our audience, our audience likely has the same reactions that all of us and all of you just had. A couple more nice. comments coming in. You know, it's unclear what's important. Uh, no specific data points pop out. There's not an obvious story. Um, some ideas for justifying the numbers to make them easier to compare. Right, and on your point earlier, if tables feel like a simple way to show data, but they take a ton of work to process, right? Because we're reading, we're scanning, we're trying to mentally hold on to numbers so we can compare them to other numbers. It's a pretty taxing cognitive process. I'm curious, Alex, when you look at this data, what ideas do you have? Do you think of other ways we might show it? Yeah, absolutely. So my immediate inclination is that I want to play around with graphing this data. And because I can see that those last two columns sum to 100%, I might actually start off with something a little bit controversial, right? Part to whole. No, don't That's go there. That's what I'm thinking. I might start off with a pie chart. Just saying that, putting that out there. But I'd also experiment with other visuals, right? Maybe looking at a 100% stacked bar chart, a bar chart itself, just a regular one. Or maybe because we have time series, lines might be a good option here. So I'd want to get into graphing this data, see what is popping out, right? What might be an insight that I would then point out to somebody else. Just watching as some comments come in. Yeah, I think one of the challenges that happens when we don't focus on a specific takeaway or a specific story is it actually makes it easier for people to just pick apart the visual, right? And potentially focus on things that aren't relevant or meaningful. And so, Elizabeth, can you share, how do you think about when we lack context, right? When we go into an example and we don't necessarily have subject matter expertise, where do you go from there? How do you figure out where to direct attention or what to highlight? Well, it's an interesting um, exercise for us because all of us are very analytical people. So I think we want to spend a lot of time with the data and figure out, um, you know, I can see a comment here, well, this company is using very traditional methods of advertising. So why, right? Isn't social media and paid search? So I think sometimes we tend to like want to really understand the, the organization behind the data. And, you know, you could kind of go down a rabbit hole and spend a lot of time. And we're really more about how do we illustrate different approaches, right? So, you know, our job is not to come in and say like, we well, really should increase social media advertising because that's where it is but it's more about you know how can we take the way that they're currently visualizing the data and show them multiple approaches and teach people how to think differently about why might you choose one over the other so should we go ahead and take a look at some alternatives for this one yeah I think let's do it so when it comes to different ways that we could visualize this data I think I had to sum up my feedback for this particular example in two kind of main categories the first would be the number of elements on a page we're asking our audience to keep track of. So when we design graphs, we want to be aware of how much brain power it takes for our audience to process not only the data that they're seeing, but also everything else that we put on the page. So many of us are commenting on the green, uh, the liberal use of green, and the borders. Um, you know, all of those things are pretty, certainly, and our tool, Excel, encourages us to put those things there but they're not really providing enough value to make up for their presence. 
So when we think about shifting between analyzing data and communicating with data, we want to get comfortable stripping away all of those elements that could be distracting to our audience. So here is what the exact same table looks like if I've taken away all that superfluous uh, elements that were there. Uh, but we don't want to just stop here, right? So if we are choosing to visualize this data in a table, which we'll talk about alternatives momentarily, I just want to think about you know, what is it I would want an audience to do with this, right? Because currently with this table, I can look up specific values. I could look at direct mail and get a specific level of detail with the data. Um, I might also want to compare values so I could jump from line to line. Uh, so anything I can do to make this data more visual for my audience will help alleviate some of that processing. So I can introduce some visual cues. Um, a heat map is a great way to provide that when you're communicating with tables. So I'm encoding the relative magnitude of the numbers with intensity of color. And I've also put that in words, right? If that's the thing I want you to pay attention to, making it very clear that direct mail has increased by a million and a half this quarter. Um, I could also employ the same strategy to maybe it's the part to whole, the proportion that's going to be more interesting to the particular audience and focus on the direct mail as nearly two thirds of our spend. So these two things I've shown, color and words, are what we consider the lowest hanging fruit when you're communicating with data. They're the easiest to implement typically and they also have a lot of impact. So you can already tell what a difference this is. Even if I just stopped here, um, what an easier experience we all have with this table. So that was the first piece of feedback, is thinking about how can we strip away anything that's not essential. The second piece is making this data visual, more visual than it already is. And by doing that, then we can shift to thinking about graphs. And then the question becomes, well, which graph, right? Our tools would give us hundreds of different ways that we might potentially graph the data. So it can become daunting sometimes to figure out what is the right way to graph my data? And there isn't a single right way, right? Data can be graphed many different ways. So in the thought process of choosing an effective graph, it can be useful to create multiple versions of the same data and then just take a step back and talk through what does each view allow an audience to more or less easily see. So I thought what I'd do now is uh, cycle through a couple different ways we might visualize this data, talk about some pros and cons of each. All right, so Alex, here is your Hi. Thank you. <laughs> wow. All right, so what we're showing here is um, our second quarter advertising spend. You can see how each of these components add up to the whole. Now, I did choose to graph some of those smaller categories in an all other. Uh, you can imagine there were a lot of those, so there would be tiny slices that could have particularly been distracting. And so the benefit we get with uh, pie charts is that they emphasize these part to whole relationships of our data. So we can see that direct mail is the majority of our Q2 advertising spend. Uh, the reason I probably would not uh, choose a pie for this is because there are more nuances to this data than I think this one particular pie chart is getting across. Right here, we can only get across what's happening in Q2. And if I needed to compare that to what's happening in Q3, it's just a little bit harder to see, did those slices increase, did they decrease, particularly when they're very similar in size, like they are here. So pi is an option, but I probably would not choose it for this particular data set because there's some more nuanced things than I want to be able to say. So let's move on now to our second option, which is 100% stacked bars. So with this view, we get the holistic view that we had with pies. Uh, but notice what an easier comparison it is when I utilize a common baseline, which here is the horizontal x-axis. So now it's more easy to see that direct mail has slightly decreased this quarter compared to the, where it was in the pie chart. So this would be a view to use if I wanted to still provide that part to whole relationship and also be able to enable a comparison. Uh, there's other ways we can visualize this data, certainly. So we could use a stacked bar rather than 100% stacked bar. And you'll notice in this view, what I get that I didn't get with the previous view is a sense of absolute increase. So we can see now that the third quarter has increased both in total and direct mail increased about a million 
uh, each. So proportionally, what we had in the previous view was the decrease proportionally. We can tell this is more absolute in this view here. So this would be a view to choose if we wanted to provide our audience a sense of the total volume change quarter over quarter. Now when it comes to comparisons, a uh, fourth view we could think about would be uh, pairwise vertical bars. And so here we're showing both uh, quarters, quarter two, quarter three, close to one another. So I'm more able to uh, emphasize that comparison the closer I put things together. And so what's interesting about this view is what really jumps out is how tall those green bars are. Right? We were already aware that the direct mail is our largest spend. So this would be a nice view if I really wanted to emphasize that to my audience. Right? Look how much we are spending on direct mail compared to some of these other channels. So if I needed to provide a sense of possible opportunity or a sense of scale of how different our spend is across these different categories, this would be a nice way to get that across. Um, However, if there was anything interesting happening in those smaller categories, uh, it gets a little masked here, right? Because that one, that one category direct mail is so large. So I might instead um, opt to put that in text. And so by doing that, I could actually just strip it away completely and only show the remaining categories. As long as I was clear that I had removed something and that these still added up to 100%. Uh, you wanna be aware of any time you put numbers, particularly percentages, in front of your audience, they will likely be adding things up and figuring out how does this all relate. So this would be a way to alleviate some of that guessing there. Uh, so this is an option if I wanted to emphasize what's happening with these smaller categories uh, and not have the focus be on direct mail. So we have looked at several different views here. Now I should add these are not the only ways to graph it, right? These are only just four. Um, but I'm curious, you know, reactions, thoughts, what do you all think? I'm curious to hear what folks in the greater world feel, but I'm curious about the difference that you see between these pies and the 100% stacked bars, because it feels like 100% stacked bars is just kind of like a pie chart that's easier to read. Uh, so do you see that there's any reason why you would ever use a pie chart versus a 100% stacked bar if you're trying to show that sort of part to whole comparison? Uh, not for this data set. I think if the only thing, if it was only one quarter, Mm -hmm. The pie could work, and if you just wanted to get across that, you know, 65% of our spend is on the direct mail, that could work mm -hmm. um, if it's a, a smaller subset of this data. But the interesting things that are happening here are not just what's happening with one quarter with one category, it's what's happening with multiple categories across multiple quarters. So that's where I think a pie chart doesn't really get the point across as well. Uh, but that being said, the the thing about communicating with data, it, it is all about your audience, and some people love pie charts. So I can think back to prior roles where, you know, my manager wanted things in a pie chart, and guess what? I gave him pie charts. <laughs> <laughs> because there is a little bit of finesse when it comes to communicating with data in, you know, particularly settings where people are used to seeing data a certain way, that all of a sudden you want to try to encourage them to adopt new ways of doing things. There can be a little bit of meeting people where they are. Um, and I think there's value in sometimes uh, sticking with charts that people already know how to read and then moving them past other things. So, what are we seeing in chat, Cole? You know, not a lot in chat yet. I All think right. maybe it's people lacking context and so not being sure which view might work in this particular case. I, I will encourage folks who are tuning in live, if you have a preference for one of these, go ahead and put that in chat. But there was some context about the client organization in mm -hmm. this case that uh, may be worth talking a little bit about here too. Yeah, so this particular client um, I would consider was very early on in their data visualization journey, so they were comfortable communicating with tables. Um, and so this particular team was just kind of used to sending out tables like the original graph that we're the visual, visual that we all saw. Um, and so it kind of goes back to what we were talking about. You know, if they're used to sending things out as tables, their audiences are probably used to seeing things in tables. Um, and it's not that tables are bad, it's just that you want to you ask yourself, what, is my, what do my audience need to do with this? Do they need to look up specific values or is there something 
interesting in the data that would be um, easier to see if it were in a graph. So when I mentioned these are um, not the only ways that we could graph these. There's certainly other options uh, that would emphasize the delta a little bit. You could do a slope graph, you could do a dot plot, um, things that are a little less common. Um, options, but uh, the reason that I stuck with these four was because they were, this particular client was in a step of just trying to move beyond tables. Yeah, and that's a nice first step, right? When, as we all experienced when we looked at that table at the beginning, you know, your first time looking at any table with which you're unfamiliar, takes some time to figure out what you're looking at and then mental brain power to try to visualize it. Whereas we can take some subset of that same data oftentimes and visualize it and it, and it takes out an entire step in interpretation for people when we do that well. Uh, there has been a chance for a number of folks to weigh in now via chat, and it looks like the majority are voting for number four. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so few other options here, but um, people are liking the pairwise bars. Uh, I think for a lot of the reasons you talked about, mm -hmm. right, it makes that comparison between what happened last quarter versus this quarter really easy and quick to be able to see. Yeah, and I'm seeing a couple other people. What about a dumbbell plot? What about slope graphs? And yeah, absolutely. These are not the only four ways that you could do it. It's just being thoughtful about, does my audience know how to read a dumbbell? Does my audience know how to read a slope graph? Um, if you're for sure that they do, and you think that that view would emphasize something uh, differently than either of those were, absolutely. Um, I've, I, in my experience, I always found any graph that I design is gonna make sense to me, and when I do the analysis, I already know what's interesting about it, and so sometimes I think, you tend to want to choose charts that are more novel, that are novel, just to kind of you know break the monotony or you know entertain yourself a little bit more. So sometimes when you would show that to your audience, you would hear reactions like, "Oh, hmm," and they're not really sure what it is they're seeing. So it's not to say we couldn't use more novel graphs than this. It's just being aware: would it be worth the time to educate my audience on how to read them? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. So which was your favorite? Which was my favorite? I would go with number four as well. Um, I think this is the view that kind of going back to the question or the comment earlier around thinking about how do I get, what might the story be, right? If the story is that we're spending a lot of money on direct mail and maybe that's working, maybe that's not working so well, but if I really wanted to drive a conversation about where our largest spend is, I would probably choose option number four because I think you can just see how different these categories are with this orientation. Um, so if I were going to go with option number four, I wouldn't just stop with the way that it looks currently, but rather I would be mindful around what might my audience need to do with this data. Does this suggest we need to keep spending the same amount? Does this suggest we need to change something? Uh, are they even aware of this to begin with, right? So thinking about uh, where, what is my audience coming to the table uh, from? So not just going with the graph as you see it currently, but rather designing it as part of a visual that helps them think about the so what. So you'll notice I've paired it with a, a takeaway title that tells you this is what I want you to pay attention to, that direct mail is our largest advertising expense and provided some additional context through annotations. And in this case, if there was a call to action, I could even put that possibly into words as well. All right, so we have transformed a table. Yeah, and I think one of the great parts of the process that you showed us here, Elizabeth, and this was actually something that people commented on when we were originally looking at that table, is just we're not sure where to go from here, right? It's not obvious necessarily what graph is going to work well. And so oftentimes it means looking at data a few different ways and making that sort of side-by-side -side comparison to be able to both understand our data better, but then also in light of our data and the context and what we want to use that data to drive people towards, then we can see and assess those things. And it doesn't mean that it has to be obvious when we're looking at a table what the graph should be. But to make sure we've got time as part of our process to be able to iterate through some different views and find one that will help us make our message clear to our audience. Well, we get a common question about time, and that is that takes time to create multiple different graphs. So how much time should we be spending? Yeah. Always that? more than you think you should <laughs> uh, <Right>. is <laughs> the way I typically answer that one. 
So yeah, time is an important part of the process. What can you do with that time? You can iterate through different views. You can highlight strategically. You can use words thoughtfully. So there's some great lessons that we saw out of this example. Let's take a look at another one. Well, hey folks, uh, my name's Mike. I am also a data storyteller here at Storytelling with Data. It is a mouthful, but it's good work if you can get it. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about today is emphasizing an, emphasize, emphasizing an insight based on an original graph that was submitted to us uh, by one of our clients. Now this has been a little bit anonymized, uh, as you may expect to protect the original creator, but what we're going to be looking at here is something created by a regional uh, Realtors Association. And it was a graph that is showing us, over the last few years, what were the average housing prices in Hamilton County. So as you look at this graph, you can see we have three different data series here. We have three different lines, each one representing one of the last three years. On our vertical axis, we're showing the average housing price, the houses sold went for on average somewhere between uh, $450,000 and $600,000. So this is the monthly average price in the county. You can also see that uh, we don't have full data yet for 2021 because uh, it is currently October of 2021 and we are not done with this year yet. So we have data through August. Now, if you are watching us live right now, you'll have the opportunity to share your thoughts on this graph, not just here in the chat, which we encourage you to do, by the way, uh, but also you have the opportunity to make over this graph yourself. This is on the Storytelling with Data website. It is the monthly Storytelling with Data Challenge. We encourage you to take a look at this graph. You can download it or you can check it out for yourself and think about how you might strengthen this graph in any way that you might choose to do so. Now, we all do this on a regular basis for our clients, so before I talk a little bit about how I might approach it, I'd like to open it up to my colleagues here and see what stands out for you. Let's, Alex, let's start with you. What stands out for you in this graph? How might you start to approach uh, maybe strengthening the messages you see here? Well, yeah. that 2021 line, right? That mm -hmm. purple, thick line, right? It's mm -hmm. clear that there's a focal point with mm -hmm. this visual. Now, the confusing part that I have is the fact that the other lines aren't solid too, right? So when I typically see a dashed line, I'm used to that being a forecast, a target, or something along mm -hmm. that. So it raises a question in my mind, is this actual data? Was this an estimate that we're comparing against? So I would probably <laughs> encourage uh, folks to use solid lines whenever it's actual right. data. So that would certainly be a recommendation. But I do think that the creator of this graph should get kudos, the fact that there is a clear focal point. And it makes sense that it would be the most mm -hmm. recent year there. Right. I like the idea that it's just the memory of the data. Like yeah. it's, it's kind of what we remember the monthly average was. That's why Fair. we're doing it as dotted lines. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, what stands out to you in this particular visual? I don't know if it's what stands out or maybe what doesn't stand out. All right. <laughs> I'll start there. I think anytime I look at graphs that I've never seen before, I'm always looking for evidence of what I'm looking for, right? So the y-axis isn't labeled. All right, so then I look at the chart title and I see this as average monthly home sales. So then my question is, is this price? Is this volume of sales? Okay, this is probably price because I see that in the top and then I see it dollar signs and the x-axis. So that was a lot of scanning to figure out <laughs> what I'm looking uh -huh. at and I just wonder is there opportunity to make that a little more straightforward and clear that yeah. I don't have to do that work and figure that out because a real audience likely would not. They would have just yeah. moved on. Now, and, and you have said this uh, in the past, is you always know what you mean when you create a graph, and so it's obvious to you, well, clearly this is prices. Yeah. I don't have to label this, I don't have to make this clear. It should be obvious to anybody looking at it, but it never is quite as obvious as you think it is. Yeah. Now, Cole, you're taking the temperature of the uh, internet viewers, our live viewers. Are there any thoughts coming in from folks watching us? Indeed. People are pretty emphatic that the legend is not working. Uh, we have people professing allergy, allergic reactions yeah. to legends, <laughs> far from one. the data set. <laughs> Seasonal um, allergies to, to legends. <laughs> Dan suggests we should label the lines directly. Uh -huh. uh, he's not the only one. Lots of votes for direct labeling. Chris makes a good point, which is, asks a good question what is the so what? No idea what I'm supposed to do with right. this, right? Which was something that we saw with the original example as well. 
And then we have some people wanting to change or eliminate elements. Okay. I think Brandon says it best, uh, ditch the grid lines. <laughs> ditch the grid lines? But the grid lines are so useful. If we didn't have the grid lines there, how would we know what the price was or what the month is? Well, how would you use that grid line, Mike? <laughs> well, when we think about these grid lines, like this is a throwback to when we used to use graph paper. Right? And we used to have to give ourselves some kind of guideline so we could accurately draw something on a piece of paper. But our tools don't have to have that. Our tools actually know where to plot things accurately. So those grid lines are actually just distracting us. They're just taking up our attention. They don't really need to be there at all. And uh, I think this is something that, uh, Cole, you've said in the past as well, is that it gives a false sense of precision. Like any time that we're drawing a graph, we're not going to be exactly as precise as maybe you might think you are. And if we add these grid lines in, we're telling people or we're implying to people that we're being a lot more precise than we actually are. So I think that really these grid lines are not necessary. And in fact, we'd be better off getting rid of them and maybe cleaning this up if we were going to strengthen the messages here. So I'm going to start by just making this graph a little bit more comfortable to look at, neutralizing the color uh, to start with. Uh, because I always like to start with a neutral palette. We've labeled that axis. That was a suggestion that came in as well to make sure that people know exactly what we're looking at along that Y axis. Uh, we are also putting a few more intervals in there, making the interval on that y-axis a little bit smaller. So it seems like one continuous element rather than a jagged, toothy little thing along our axis that grabs our attention. This appearance of a smoother axis with shorter distances between our intervals actually makes it feel like a more unified element. It makes it feel like a neater and more organized view of the data. We also had a title hanging out in space that was centrally located, centered above our graph. Instead, we're going to bump that over to the left-hand side here. Helps to visually frame our graph. And also, by putting something like that in the top left corner, makes it easier for people to see what's coming as they start to scan down a graph or scan down a page in a sort of a left to right zigzaggy manner. Now, for folks who were allergic to legend, um, bless you, um, uh, the legend is now gone. We have directly labeled our lines. And uh, to help Alex feel more comfortable with the graph as well, we've also gotten rid of the dotted line. So everything is now a solid line. And from here, we can think about how we're going to emphasize certain things in our data. Now, it seemed like that 2021 line was the thing that people wanted to emphasize. So there are a couple ways we can do this. And, you can imagine uh, if we had this printed out in front of us, there are a couple of low-tech ways we might do this. You know, the big old arrow just pointing at 2021, or maybe we circle that year just for fun, or maybe we circle just the label of the year rather than the whole line, or maybe we have some editorial comments about how prices are going up and up. Yikes, how's anybody going to afford this <laughs> in the current market? But you know, if we're the people who are creating this graph, we can stand to be a little more elegant take a more specific and technical approach to how we would focus attention on this particular line. First thing, I might start to thicken that line up, make it stand out from the other lines around it. And as we start to add different ways of emphasizing these lines in or this series in, we're not just going to do one or another or another. We're sort of going to combine them, stack them together. So this specific data series stands out as much as possible thicken it up. We could make it a really big dotted line, but why would we do that? We just talked about how that dotted line is for more for reference lines or forecast data, and also that's, that's really unpleasant to look at, so I'm not going to do that. Let's just make it a stronger, bolder color here. We'll make the intensity much higher so that that line stands out more. Or maybe we even make it a purple color, bring that purple color back that was used originally, because that color using one single color will definitely make it stand out from the gray of everything else around it. Now, you can use color, you can use words, you can use color and words to focus attention. If I put a color, uh, if I use color in the words that I'm using above my graph to tell you, hey, not only should you look at 2021, but here's why you should look at it, because it had the highest average home sale price of any of our recent years, 
Now you know what to look at, you know why I'm asking you to look at it, and you can find it more easily because I've used the same color in my text as I have in the graph itself, and it helps to tie those elements together. You know, what else could we do to get people's attention? You know, in a live setting, and currently we are in a live setting, we could use step-by-step -step animation. I could say, you know, in 2019, home prices were pretty flat. They fluctuated a little bit seasonally. In 2020, they went up just a little bit, and that seasonality sort of tracked along with 2019. But you know, in 2021, things went off the rails. Prices skyrocketed compared to the prior two years. And you see there's this huge spike in July, which we might want to look at as well. But we can see that we are tracking higher than the previous years across each of the months we've seen so far. Another thing we might do, start to bring in some data markers, start to bring in some labels that'll direct your attention to, but I think of this as bold facing for your data, is you really only want to use data markers and data labels to highlight the specific points that you think are the most important. If you use bold faced everywhere in text, it's like bold facing nothing, nothing is emphasized. Here we want to be smart about what we emphasize. So maybe I emphasize August of 2021 and 2020 and 2019, so we see these comparisons very easily. Now, I didn't give you the context about why people were creating this graph in the first place. Maybe it was to be shown to the public. Maybe it was to be shown in a report for other realtors. And these are the sorts of things that are going to affect the decisions we make about what we choose to highlight and how we highlight it. So if this is a report for other realtors, maybe we want to keep all of this detail in so you can see the trends over time, month to month. But if this something is something we're giving like to the press, we're saying, hey, year over year, prices in our county are going up and up and up. We might be a little more fun with our data. We might not have as much detail. We might go with really a fanciful bar chart. It's really an upward arrow. It kind of looks like a house. This is not the sort of thing I would normally do in a business presentation. But for the public, maybe we want to go even simpler, even more visual, use this visual metaphor of prices going up, and it sort of resembles a house. So from where we started, we were able to make a few different changes. And we could go in a lot of different directions here, depending on the audience we were trying to focus on. But ultimately, what we were doing is emphasizing one specific insight from this data rather than asking our audience to make this uh, decision all on their own and assess it without any other particular guidance. So this was a great example of getting rid of distractions mm -hmm. to our data, right? Or things that could be distracting, grid lines, sporadic uh, axis labels, uh, and then also really focusing attention, right? Using that strategic contrast to make it clear to our audience where to look. Now, Mike mentioned this earlier, but I'll just reiterate it again for folks who are watching. Uh, there's been some good commentary uh, about some of the nuances of seasonality here as well. Uh, in particular, the jump that we see annually from December to January that gets a little hidden in this format. So for anyone who would like to play with this data directly, check out the October 2021 challenge. That's at community.storytellingwithdata.com. Uh, if you catch it live, you can make over the data yourself. Uh, if you're watching after the fact, you'll have dozens of additional approaches to be able to look through there and provide your commentary on. And it's always a really interesting way of continuing the learning, right? To compare and contrast different approaches that people have taken to the same data visualization challenge. With that, let's hand things over to Alex. Hi everyone, my name is Alex, and the makeover that we're going to look at next, the big theme is to really translate that analysis into something that your audience can understand, they can digest and hopefully use to make a smarter decision. Now, the makeover that I'm gonna share with you, I'll warn you ahead of time, it's a little bit complex. So I'm gonna give you a moment to really just digest this. So we have a title here, it says goal, reduce skip days in tracking application. We've also got two visuals, we've got some block, box plots on the left, a survival curve on the right, a little bit of text below each chart. Now, I can tell you that when I first looked at this slide here, I had a lot of questions. And so I'm curious 
what are some of the questions that folks have when they look at this slide? So we'll start off with you, Elizabeth. When you look at this slide, what's your immediate reaction here? My immediate reaction <laughs> is not positive. There's a long pause there that we'll point <laughs> out. Bring my feedback thoughtfully. But no, it really just looks like something that was copy and pasted from a statistical tool. Um, sure. So just screenshots put into presentation. I mean, I think I do like that the title tells me what is interesting about it or what we should be looking for. I think from there on out, it's it's a little difficult to make sense of this. And I should mention, like, I'm familiar with how to read a box plot I'm in from my statistical days, but even still, I'm just trying to figure out how do the graphs relate to one another? What do I do with this data? So. Yeah, I'm sure you have questions. <laughs> and one thing I'll point out that I had that nobody else has here is I had speaker notes to this slide, which gave me context <laughs> behind what the story was. Why were we doing and sharing this experiment here? So it can get a little tough when you don't have that context. I'll make that clear in a moment. Before I do, Mike, what do you think about this view? So when I was in college, I had a roommate, OK? And he was a, bio, uh, a biology major, right? And he used to read these scientific papers. And occasionally, I would look at them, and I'd be like, I know this is English, <laughs> but this makes no sense to me. It was almost like a grammar check. It was like, can I tell what part of speech this is evenly? Because I could read this slide, and I can read the comments below it. I can read the bullets below it. And I know I'm meant to take something away from it. It's explained really well except that I don't know that context. You didn't have the level of familiarity. I didn't familiarity. have the level of familiarity. Yeah. So it's more like, I feel like I should understand this, but I don't. And when I look at like the name of the graphs, it's, you know, I know these are box plots. I know the second one is survival curves. I've heard of survival curves. I don't really think I know what they are. So I'm feeling a little sort of pushed off by this. I'm not drawn in by this. I'm not curious about it. I feel like this must be meant for somebody else because I don't have the knowledge that I need to truly interpret this graph. Yeah, which leads us to this idea, who's this meant for? Is it a technical audience? Is it somebody that has worked on this experiment? Or is it somebody who has no experience with this data to begin with? And if so, is that the right view? We'll talk about that, too. Cole, what's going on in that chat window? Yeah, folks are feeling the confusion the pain. <laughs> that we are here, wondering where to start. Uh, who the audience is, right? Sure. Is this meant for a scientific audience? If so, maybe that works. If not, we may want to reconsider. I think w one of the questions you asked early on was, what's your reaction? And the first thing that came into that was, huh? <laughs> Question mark? <laughs> right? <Concise>. So, <laughs> well, and this is going back to the idea that uh, I think Mike phrased it very well, that this, this kind of pushes you back as opposed to draws, drawing you in. And that's the challenge or one challenge that we face when we take the way that we're looking at data and assume that's going to work well to communicate to someone else is we're not making that paradigm shift to really make it work for the people on the receiving end and really bring them in in a way that's going to work for them. So the more we do that, the better off things will be, right? Do they have to be technical? Are there terms we need to define? Can we put things into plain English? So they're all things we want to be thinking about generally when we're communicating with data. Well, and somebody did a lot of work on this too, yeah. right? Yeah, I absolutely. mean, when you look at this is a 21-day experiment that was run, I would imagine there's a lot of time, there's a lot of resources for this organization that did this only to have it fall flat when we don't know <laughs> what do we do what does this mean? Well, actually, let's, we do know we should reduce skip days, but if we don't have that context, well, but even what then, does that mean? Right, so I love that the goal is written there, but what I was confused by when I read this was, does this mean this is what they want to do going mm -hmm. forward, or is that what this analysis was meant to achieve? And if so, were they successful or not in that endeavor? And that's where I don't know the answer. <laughs> So let's Alex, add what a you little bit of clarity <laughs> on what some of those answers are. And I should just mention that this specific makeover for me is something that really reminded me of an important distinction that we often make at Storytelling with Data. And that's the distinction between exploratory analysis and explanatory analysis. Where for those of you that aren't familiar, exploratory analysis is that process of really just trying to understand your data, right? Look at different views, do statistical analysis if you need to. Find those insights. But then once you've found those insights, 
That's when it's time to explain things. That's when we move into what is known as explanatory analysis. It's when you have something specific that you want to say to somebody specific. And I bring this up because this represents two distinct stages in that analytical process. And so what that means is that sometimes the way that you talk about this data, right, the way that you visualize your data is going to look a little bit different depending on what stage you're in. So as folks pointed out today, right, those box plots, those survival curves are something that for me probably fall more in that exploratory phase. Now that doesn't mean that I would never communicate with those visuals, and I can promise you that I have, uh, but it means it's going to depend on my audience, right? If I'm communicating to that technical audience, somebody that has familiarity with this experiment, I could certainly use those visuals. But for a less familiar audience, I'm gonna recommend quite a few changes here. So I'll give you a sample of today of how I might talk through this complex data set with that less familiar audience. So I might start off by saying, hi folks, my name is Alex, here today to take you through the results of an experiment that our analytical team just got done running. Now to take a step back here, set some context if you will, our app is designed to encourage mindful eating. And so the way that we do that is we encourage users to track their daily intake. And so what that means, if folks skip tracking a day, this is problematic for many different reasons. So the goal behind this experiment was to see, could we influence user behavior? If somebody skips tracking, could we get them back on track to log their daily intake? And so to experiment with that, we took all users that skipped in a given day, and we randomly assigned them into three distinct groups. Got our control group, our awareness group, and our goal-oriented group. Now that control group, we didn't do anything with these folks, right? This was really just our baseline that we could use for a point of comparison. Helped us understand what would happen if we didn't do anything. Second group we have here, as I mentioned, is called the awareness group. All right, so for these users, we sent them a one-time notification to their phone, reminding them that they skipped a day and they're gonna wanna get back into that app to start tracking their intake, right? Become that mindful eater that they, decide, that they desire to be. Now, third group, very similar to the awareness group here, but a little bit more personalized. So when someone signs up for an account with our app, we ask them an important question. What's your purpose? Why do you want to track your daily intake? They could answer things like, I wanna lose weight. I wanna eat more nutritiously. Whatever that personal reason is, our thought was that if we could remind them of their purpose, we could further influence them, remind them to start tracking that daily intake. So let's see how these notifications worked to encourage user behavior. And so to do that, we're gonna take a look at the average change in skip score. Now, skip score is a proprietary metric on our end, right? A lot of different variables that go into that. But the idea is, is that we could assign a score to any given user. It tells us how likely they are to skip. Higher the score, more likely that they'll skip tracking. Lower the score, the better. And so we wanted to compare the average change in that skip score, both before and after our experiment. So if we take a look at things for our control group, you can see that that average change in skip score is centered right around zero. Now this totally makes sense. We didn't do anything to influence behavior, so we wouldn't expect to see a change. But if we compare that to our notified groups, we can see a bit of a shift, a shift in the leftward direction, which means that we did start to influence change influence behavior. We started to lower that average skip score. Well, that's a good thing, right? This is what we hoped to see. However, that's not the full story, right? So the interesting thing is that we started to track these users' behavior over time. And when we did so, we realized that that impact that we had was actually quite short-lived. And so to help explain this, I'm gonna change the view of our data here. We'll continue to look at these three groups, comparing them individually and against one another. But I want you to take these grids that you see on the screen here. Imagine that each grid represents 100 users from each of these groups. We've got 10 of those squares going down, 10 going across. 
And so what this tells us is that for the 100 users in our control group, after a short period of time, just the first 24 hours of our experiment, 32% of them skipped again. So this is our baseline, our point of comparison. So when we compare that to our notified groups, we can see that that proportion started to shrink. 16% right? of our awareness group, 12% of that goal-oriented group. This is, again, good news. This supports what we saw in that average de decrease in skip score. But what's interesting is that when we took that time frame and we expanded it from 24 hours to seven days, just a week, each of these proportions increased. And they increased to a point where we could no longer tell the difference between these three groups. So that looks like this, where we can see after just a week, 56% of that control group skipped again, compared to 51% of the awareness group, 50% of the goal-oriented group. This is not the result that we had hoped to see. And so what this tells us is that we need to do more. Now, this experiment was not a fail, right? We did learn things. We realized that we could influence behavior, but we're gonna need to do a lot more than just a one-time notification. And so what I wanna do here today is use the rest of our time together to brainstorm what those additional inducements might actually look like and how we could start to implement them in near real time because we know a one-time notification certainly isn't going to be enough. I also want folks to start thinking more broadly, not just about what we do after someone skips, but what can we do to prevent skipping? How can we make tracking daily intake a regular part of our users' routine? So I might talk through my data with something that sounds and looks like that. We can tell I've added quite a bit of context to help make this complex data set a little bit more welcoming to your point, <laughs> Mike. And so this is a slide that I would probably leave up, that discussion slide that I just shared previously, that I'd probably leave up in a live meeting to help facilitate that discussion. But then if I had to put all of that story into a single view, maybe to share after the meeting, to remind folks of what that experiment actually was, I might create something that looks like this. I would take a lot of the same visuals that I shared in that live version and include them in this view to remind folks of what it is we talked about, serve as that visual reminder. You'll also notice that there's some supporting text. I'd have elaborated on what that final takeaway from that experiment is in my takeaway title, added some of that descriptive text right below. And the idea being that because this is a complex and meaty data set, I still want somebody else to be able to make sense of this without me there to actually talk through it. And so if we take a look at the before and after here, what we have is an analysis translated, right? Same data, same exploratory analysis, if you will, right? But really starting to recognize that the way that we package and talk through our data may change depending on where we are in that analytical process. So I highly recommend anytime you're getting ready to start communicating your exploratory analysis, take that time up front to just pause. Right? Consider your audience, their background knowledge, and recognize, accept the fact that the graphs that you use to understand your data may not be the ones that you want to use to explain that, especially to a less familiar audience. So now that I have taken you through how I might approach this, I'm curious, what do you think of this data? Is it a little bit more clear for everyone? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't believe it's the same data and the same story. It's the, the before is so impenetrable, and the right just makes so much more sense. I would know exactly what you found. I would know what we were meant to do with it. Like, it's just so much more effective as a way of communicating the exact same way. And it's sort of translating from the scientist perspective to the layman's perspective. Of, oh, thank you. Thank you for translating that for me so I can understand what to do now. 
Absolutely, and part of that is just we have the context, right? I can imagine you could still make that left version, that before version with the box plots and the survival curves, a little bit easier to understand if we had that context, those speaker notes that I had. <laughs> well, another thing I'll add is the fact that you were able to talk us through all of the different metrics because there's something about you know just looking at this and not knowing what the point is and also trying to figure it out where you know I found myself listening to you and then being able to more focus on certain things because that's the only thing I could see. Which are so it really illustrates how important we, the communicators, and I don't mean we, the four of us, I mean all of us who are communicating with data are when it comes to getting our audience to understand something. We play a really important role, probably more than we realize. So. Yeah, a critical role. I have another question for you. So how, what is your kind of first step between that before and the after? Because I know you did not just sit down at your computer and that progression of well, slides. Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> just came out like that. Like how, how did you at least, how did you even get started in that makeover? Well, this was, in, so if this were my data and I was the analyst behind that, I would have had the context there. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, I didn't have that. So first step was gathering that understanding, right? Defining what is a skip score? If it goes up, if it goes down, is that a good or is that a bad thing? And then just trying to find evidence of some of the statements that were below in those bullet points in the data. Um, and I will say that I've communicated uh, results like this to, to even a CEO, where I send them box plots, I send them survival curves. And so I have a little bit of experience in knowing that that's not the way to do so. <laughs> and oftentimes with survival analysis, when you're communicating to a less familiar audience, it's about teasing those key level metrics, right? At what point do you want your audience to focus on? And so I knew that was going to be something uh, that I wanted to show. And so I experimented with plenty of different visuals. I, often, I actually asked myself, do I need a visual? Right? If I'm just going to talk about 32% of this group uh, skipped or didn't skip, could I just say that in text directly? And so uh, for me, it was a lot of going back and forth, sketching out graphs, and getting feedback from others, seeing what made sense, what didn't make sense, where I needed to level set further. What are you seeing in the chat window? Lots of great stuff in the chat window. Uh, people being really impressed at the walk through the waffle charts and just feeling like they could follow along without feeling like they didn't understand what was going on. I think Barbara summed it up best. She says, so impressive how five minutes of being totally puzzled at the beginning turned <laughs> into five minutes of understanding. Thanks, Alex. And it was, right? Such a beautiful display of not only really intentionally making that distinction between how we explore data and how we explain data, but then thoughtfully walking our audience through an experience, through a story that really helps make the message and the understanding and the action clear. So I want to say a big thanks to everyone tuning in today. A big thanks to the team here for sharing their work and the insights into the thought process. Uh, for anyone who's looking for related resources, there are some that have been shared in the chat. For sure, check out everything that we offer at storytellingwithdata.com. Uh, the community also there, community.storytellingwithdata.com. There are ways to practice and get feedback and engage in conversations. You'll want to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Subscribe and like us on YouTube. Leave some comments down below. Click the bell for notifications. And thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.